I hope you all finished. Um, I'll go quickly through the expression QC chapter for the reads. So it's exactly the same analysis that we've done for the, for the UMIs, but now we are using the reads table. So again, we can have a look at the, at the table and it, immediately you can see that the number of uh, the expression values in this table are much higher than the ones that we had in UMIs. This is because of the amplification. Um, then we again define the controls, ERCCs and mitochondrial genes. Uh, and this is the first diagram, uh, which shows us the, uh, the histogram of total counts per cell. And it looks quite different from what we saw before. So now it, it's kind of more by model. So we have more reads, uh, more cells with low number of total counts. Uh, the reason for that might be amplification bias or something else. It's hard to say exactly what's the reason for that, but it's again, it's good to filter the things that you are not sure about <coughs> from your data set. So here we define a threshold here and remove all the, all the cells on the left. And actually this filter removes 180 cells. So we have more cells removed in this case. Uh, the histogram of total features is, the shape is quite similar to what we saw in UMIs. Again, this threshold is, is manually defined. You can change it if you want. So we define it here uh, at 7,000 total features. And this removes 120 cells. Now, if we look at the uh, plots with the, with the controls. So the first plot is the uh, expression percentage of counts in mitochondrial genes against the total features. So we, what we can see here is that the percentage uh, compared to the UMIs, percentage of reads in mitochondrial genes increased. Um, so I think in the previous chapter we had something up to 20%. So this again can be, the, uh, the reason for that can be amplification uh, of the reads. Um, so it's a good idea again to remove something which is very strongly uh, expressed. So what, what we do is, uh, let me see. So we actually, we don't remove mitochondrial genes, but you can do it if you want. So you, you will still, if you, if you set a threshold somewhere, 20 or 25, you will remove uh, some, some cells. Uh, now if you look at uh, ERCC's plot, so uh, the difference, the main difference between the reads and UMIs is that the bad batch is not as separated as it was in UMI data set. So it, it again proves that if you have a choice, it's better to use UMIs, they're more, the data is much more cleaner than the read data. And again, the, the percentage of the ERCCs in some cells is much higher. So here we remove the bad batch because we can actually see that it's bad. Uh, and we also remove all the cells that are higher than 25% of ERCCs. So this filter removes 100 cells approximately. Okay, so we actually use the mitochondrial filter here. So we only keep cells with less than 30% of mitochondrial reads. Uh, so then we apply all our four filters defined above to our object. And then we can again use the skater default filter and Skater automatic filter. So here it's actually, uh, it's not as obvious as it was with the UMI. So I think this the bad batch is not as clean. Probably, I think this, this is the bad batch, most probably. But 
the default field removes some other cells instead. Um, and then we can again compare these three filters with each other. Uh, and again, we can see that our filter, the manual filter, picks up all the cells that were picked up by the default uh, automatic and default filter of skater. And uh, if we do the gene filtering with the reads data set, again, as expected, we remove less genes uh, because the coverage is higher. So you have high expression per gene. And this filter, the filter that we use, tries to remove uh, lowly expressed genes. So we it's expected to remove less genes than in UMI data set. So at the end, when we apply all the filters, we have 600 cells, 605 cells, and about 16,000 uh, genes. And again, please save this data set to this folder because we're going to use it in the next chapters. So are we are we we having another chapter? Sorry. Yeah. So do you have any questions? So these are I think this is it for the quality control. Now we're gonna move to the next chapters. <coughs> um, okay, so the next chapter is about data visualization. So we have already seen so far the PCA plots of your data. So this is one way of visualizing your data set. There are some other ways. So um, as we mentioned before, Skater provides lots of functions to visualize your data. It, these functions include PCA plots, TSNE plots, and some other. So here we will cover some of them. So if you can, again, you can use an RMD file to run this code, or you can copy paste it from the website. Um, so here we introduce the PCA plot, uh, which we probably have had to do earlier. But uh, is everyone familiar with PCA plot? Or do you want me to explain it in more details, how it's done? Does anybody know what, doesn't know what PCA plot is? You can explain it more. Yeah, okay. So, uh, PCA plot is probably one of the easiest way to visualize your high, a highly dimensional data set. So basically what it does is uh, mathematically, what PCA does, it takes your expression matrix, then it calculates covariance matrix uh, from, your, from the columns of your data set, so your cells. And then it computes eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. And then usually those eigenvectors are sorted in the descending order, so you have the first eigenvector corresponds to the eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue, which means it contains the largest amount of information. And what you usually do, you take the first two or three eigenvectors and then you visualize them instead of using the whole data set. And so this is a simple diagram what happens. So if you have a data set, uh, a PCA analysis identifies basically a plane it also transforms the data and that identifies the plane where, which contains the, the most variance in your data. And then if you, if you project your data to this plane, this is what you usually see. So we used PCA plots in the previous two chapters already. So for each, uh, in, in our PCA plots, so usually each point corresponded to, the, to a cell. <coughs> So now we can actually look at how PCA plot for our data set looks like before the quality control and after the quality control, right? Because we have uh, identified all the filters, we can do that. So if we, if we plot, uh, so again, the skater, skater provides this plot PCA function, which you can use. Uh, so here we use the UMI object that we defined and saved before. And 
only use the endogenous genes. So we, we don't want to use ERCCs or mitochondrial genes. We also ask to, to uh, make a PCA plot based on the top 500 genes. So we don't want to take into account all the genes that we have in the data set. And then we color, size, and shape it by uh, batch, total features, and individual. So before the quality control, uh, we can see that basically, again, this bad batch pops up, which, is, which means it, it, it's quite strong. You don't even need ERCCs for that. Is it correct, right? So we don't use ERCCs here. No, so it's, it's an endogenous thing. Yeah, so, so yeah. Yeah, so which means, yeah, the signal is, is not just from ERCCs. It's something wrong with these cells. Um, and then if we apply uh, quality uh, gene filter and cell filter, so this, is, this data set is called UMIQC. It's different now. Uh, what we can see is that Basically, we still have the orange color here, but as you can see, the batch, the bad batch is removed. Just the colors are the same, but we have one less uh, batch here. And what, what this plot shows is that the data looks more homogeneous, which is good. So after the quality control, we want to see something homogeneous because we removed all the bad cells. <coughs> So we have a couple of exercises here. So if you run the same, uh, if you want to plot the same uh, PCA plots, but instead of using the top 500 genes, if you use all genes, all 14,000 14, genes, uh, would you be able to see any difference in your plot? So basically what you need to do is just to change, just remove this argument from the, from the function here. So we don't want to use 500 top genes. Uh, and this, this is how the plots look like. So, so this is run on the uh, quality control data set. So we don't have a bad batch here. But now we take into account all 14,000 genes. And as you can see, the data set becomes more heterogeneous compared to what we saw before. Uh, and then instead, if we use 50 genes, which is even less than 500, again, we can see that everything kind of collapses and becomes more homogeneous. So when you use all the genes in this top plot, the reason for having more heterogeneous plot is probably because you add more noise to your data. The more genes you add, the more noise you have. Because uh, SCATA selects top 500 genes based on the, on the expression values. So if you add the rest, the rest are usually less expressed and they add more noise to your data. Um, so any questions about the PCA plot? So the next plot that you can make using Skater is a TSNE map. So this, this approach has become very popular recently and almost at every conference that you go to in single cell, you will see thousands of TSNE plots and people use them quite a lot. So originally, um, TSNE means T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Uh, that's the abbreviation. So originally, I think it was developed for processing of large data sets uh, for some re recognition patterns. And uh, I think it, somebody started using it in single cell and it became very popular. So what happens here is that um, uh, this method combines dimensionality reduction with random walks on the nearest neighbor network to map high dimensional data. Um, so TSNE, so I, I'm not going to, into details and explain it here. Basically, you embed 
your data into two dimensions. It's, it's different from PCA, but the concept is similar. So instead of looking at thousands of dimensions that you have, you embed your data set on, on two dimensions. But con in contrast to PCA, TSNI is a stochastic algorithm. So if you run it multiple times, you will get different results. And this is, this is one of the big problems of TSNI plots. When you see some plot uh, on the slide at the conference, you actually, you can be really sure that you won't get different results if you run it again. So, <coughs> what else do we have here? So yeah, so let's just run TSNI plot on our data set. So here we run it on UMI object, which is not quality controlled. And uh, this is what we get. So another thing to mention is in, in TSNI there is another parameter which is called perplexity, which defines the, uh, is it the density? I think it defines the density of the point on your TSNI plot. So basically here with this manually defined parameter, we get this kind of plot. Uh, what you can see is it, it finds the bad batch for us, right? So again, this orange batch that we saw before. But everything else is quite messy and it's really hard to, to say anything about the data. So I think we have a couple of, ex no, first we plot the same thing, but using the UMI QC data set. So this after the quality control. So that's what we get with the same perplexity. Uh, and note that we don't have this bad batch here again. So there are eight batches instead of nine, but we still have the orange color, which, which, is, which is now a different batch. Uh, it's again hard to say whether the data is homogeneous or heterogeneous. Maybe one thing to play with is to change, to, to change the perplexity parameter. So I think we have a couple of exercises here. Um, so what happens if you change perplexity to 10 or to 200? So you can, you can again follow the, the website or use your RMD files and run this and see what the, difference, what the differences are. And probably more importantly, there is a, a nice, uh, is it, it's a blog post, I think, where uh, TSNI is explained in quite a lot of details. And uh, you can actually see how you can get completely different plots using different perplexity parameter, different steps in your TSNI algorithm and so on. So we highly recommend you reading uh, this link here on this page. It's very useful. So from our experience, TSNI is, is really good if you have completely separate clusters, then it will visualize them quite nicely. And uh, if you run it multiple times, you will have the same clusters. If your clusters are not as separate, strongly separated, then TSNI can produce different plots with different runs. So if you use it, just be sure that you run it multiple times, you try different perplexities and so on, so that your result is not just a, uh, just a single result of TSNI. So if we run TSNI with perplexity 10, we get this plot. And if we run TSNI with perplexity 200, we get this plot. Again, it's really hard to interpret these plots, but maybe that's because our data is quite homogeneous. As I said, if we had more distinct clusters, the picture would be much better. <coughs> um, so now we also have this, another exercise where you do the same plots for the reads. So we still have like five minutes before lunch. Uh, I think we will call lunch. In the or we can go for lunch now and then you can continue doing the exercise. So I think the timetable, this lunch starts at half past 12. So now we can go for lunch. And then you can continue with the exercise after lunch. 